in recent weeks, law enforcement has crashed into religious services, including Catholic masses, while they were in progress. All of this due to supposed violations of COVID protocols. What is happening when the government can send police into churches to shut down religious services? And what are the canonical and religious freedom implications? Here with in-depth analysis of these stories and more are the Papal Posse, editor-in-chief of thecatholicthing.org and St. John Henry Newman visiting chair at Thomas More College, Robert Royal, and from Manhattan, canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray. Gents, thanks for being here. Uh, I want to begin with what seems to be uh, an increasing policy, or policing rather, of worship, not only in the U.S., but in other parts of the world. In Dallas, Texas, at the end of March, a pregnant mother attending Mass was removed from her church and nearly arrested for removing her mask after communion. Here's a bit of that altercation. Put you in handcuffs if you don't stand up. Yes, yes, yes. Am I stand getting up. arrested? No, not right now. But if you don't listen, you will be. And what would be the reason of that arrest? Oh, criminally trespassed. They don't want you on there. Criminal. But what's the What's the crime? The business, the church, does not want you here because you're choosing not to follow the rules. She told police she took the mask off because she was feeling nauseous. She was also socially distanced with her family. And it was apparently the parish priest who summoned the police. The parish has adopted a mandatory mask policy. Father Jerry, you're a parish priest. What do you make of this, and is this any way to be pastoral? Uh, this is regrettable. Um, the Archdiocese of New York, we have a mask policy, uh, but I would not call the police if someone was uncooperative. I'd first to find out what the situation is. If she was not feeling well, uh, then, you know, leave her alone by herself. Uh, and then see, you know, if mass is over, then she can be accompanied out safely. Uh, this is an overkill type of thing. It's, uh, it's making uh, one standard apply in a situation where obviously that standard needed to be set aside if the woman wasn't feeling well. Mm -hmm. Bob, your thoughts. I mean, the police officer kept calling the parish a business, telling the woman she was not wanted there before she was escorted out. Uh, the, the Catholic Diocese of Dallas and Bishop Edward Burns issued a statement. Uh, they said canon law grants pastors jurisdiction over their parishes. And while the bishop has not mandated masks for every parish, he has left those specific details to the pastors of the diocese, adding that he expects the faithful to wear masks out of charity and concern for others. Bob, your reaction? Well, I mean, I'll leave the canon law question to the canon lawyer, Father Murray, but <laughs> I, I think I would just say that this is a place where bishops have got to be a little bit more forceful, because we see in the society as a whole that there seems to be this assumption that you can do this because you can do it, because you can get away with it, that somehow religious uh, activities can be curtailed in the way that uh, you know, shopping or going to malls or going even outdoors mm -hmm. to celebrate is, is not policed. So I think that bishops, yes, I mean, it is probably true that canonically each pastor has a certain uh, amount of leeway in how he wants to handle this. But these are our people. These are our people who are showing up in churches in the very midst of this pandemic. And, and I think in the better run diocese, my own diocese in Virginia is very good about this. My pastor is very good about this. There's a certain flexibility. We recognize that some people have medical conditions. My pastor himself has been told by his doctor that he can't wear the mask because of some lung problems that he has. And, and mm -hmm. so th this kind of rigidity, it just seems to me, points towards something that people are, of course, nervous about this pandemic. But at the same time, Christians approach problems like this in a different way. We don't just police a situation like this. We don't just send in authorities mm -hmm. to remove somebody, particularly a pregnant mom, uh, from a mass in a situation like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but Father Jerry, finally, a form of rigidity that some in the church can embrace. Uh, what are the canonical implications of this incident, Father, and others like it, when it comes to priests actually calling law enforcement in on his own parishioners? Don't the laity have canonical rights as well, conscience rights? Yeah, well, everyone has a right to uh, worship God, and you have a right to uh, have access to the sacraments if you're in the state of grace. Uh, certainly, um, the, the jurisdiction of the police uh, is present in, in theory. I mean, all parts of the country are under police uh, 
administration when it comes to enforcing justice, but is this really an act of enforcing justice or a complete overreaction? Mm -hmm. I think it's just that, an overreaction. So uh, when we're dealing with pregnant mom who's not feeling well, uh, that should have been first addressed and found out, and certainly that could have been handled with no need for police present. Mm -hmm. I want to move on to a situation in the UK on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Police entered in-progress services and shut them down completely, telling people not only to leave but to go home or risk heavy fines. This is from Christ the King Polish Catholic Church during the veneration of the cross on Good Friday. Look. Ladies and gentlemen, this uh, gathering is unfortunately lawful, unlawful under the coronavirus regulations we have currently. You are not allowed to meet inside with this many people under law. At this moment in time, you need to go home, failure to comply with this direction to leave and go to your home address ultimately could lead you to be fined £200 or if you fail to give your details to you being arrested. Father Jerry, what recourse would a pastor have in a situation like this? I mean, don't religious rights, the right to worship, prevail here? Well, certainly the, the police, from what I understand, were even violating the law in England that masses were right. allowed and people could gather. Uh, secondly, you do have the principle that worship of God is a higher duty than worship of the, or, or obedience to the state. So the priest could certainly have said, uh, you know, to these police officers, I'm continuing the service. If you choose to arrest me, go ahead and arrest me, but I'm not going to submit to an unjust command of a police officer. Uh, you know, he really should have said, where's your warrant? Uh, let's get a judge, you know, to evaluate whether we're violating the law or not. Uh, but I think Bob's point here is very uh, well taken. Uh, the state will grab whatever power it can, and we have to resist it. And it's an absolute disgrace that the police would go into a church and then yet not police parks and protests and then crowded shopping areas. That's where there's more of a problem. Right. Bob, even more than the U.S. example in Dallas, this smacks of totalitarianism that we haven't seen really since the days of the Soviet Union. What do you make of this? Well, it's a different country, and I don't know the, the legal situation all that well. But I would say again that they do this because they know they can. That some people mm. in our society, and it's a fairly large minority, I think, still, but growing, uh, believe that religious observance in, in groups is unnecessary. That you can pray to God at home. Right. My uh, my governor in Virginia said people can, I can still pray to God wherever I am. Well, of course that's true. But there are various religious bodies, and Catholics are, and Christians are not the only ones, who believe that part of our the worship that we owe to God is to come together as a people and do that in a building. Now, in this particular case, it seems to me that the old saying of St. Paul comes to your mind. St. Paul says, you know, be obedient to every authority. But he makes it clear, as Father was just getting at, that we can only be obedient to the authorities, and, and Christians should be obedient to law, uh, but we can only be obedient when the, that, those authorities are actually applying what are proper laws, laws that respect the rights and the duties that all of us have as human beings who are created by God and therefore have certain duties toward God as well as toward the state. So I just see mm -hmm. this, again, I want to say, without knowing the legal situation in England or what the particulars were, I see this as a very worrisome um, kind of mentality that's growing, that somehow you can encroach on yeah. this because you can. Yeah. This next incident happened in Canada on Easter Sunday. Canadian police entered a Protestant Easter service with the intention of shutting it down due to the COVID protocols. The church's pastor, Arthur Palowski, had other ideas. Out! Out! Out of this property! Immediately until you come back with a warrant. Out of this property, you Nazis! I grew up under communist dictatorship, behind the Iron Curtain, under the boot of the Soviets. Police officers could break into your house five in the morning. They could beat you up, torture. They could arrest you for no matter. It was like a black, uh, you know, flashback when those police officers showed up at my church. Everything kind of came back to life from my childhood. And the only thing I could do is to fend off the wolves as a shepherd, and I used my voice to get rid of them. They were illegally 
uh, encroaching on our rights during the most holy days. It was a shocking thing. Father Jerry, as I discussed with Bob, th this certainly looks a lot like Eastern European communist tactics. Uh, do you think pastors, both Catholic and Protestant, are emboldened even to the point of being arrested, given what's happened, in, given what's happened over this last year, where we've seen uh, religious worship contract under these COVID restrictions? No, this pastor did a very good thing. He absolutely has the right to conduct his services uh, according to his understanding of what is permitted by the law in Canada. And then, as he said, get a warrant. Uh, police officers do not right. have a right to go into private homes unless they have immediate suspicion of a crime going on there. If they need, if they want to investigate, to get a warrant. You know, there, we we have laws which are based on our uh, Christian Western legal tradition, designed to protect precisely this: the ability of citizens to carry on their lives, including their religious duties, without needing to get government permission. So, God bless mm -hmm. this man. Yeah, Bob, what does it say about the state of religious freedom around the world? I mean, this isn't just happening in China anymore. Heck, the mass is even being conscripted now at the Vatican. Yes. Well, you know, I, I look at this and I say to myself, in many ways, the churches have been among the most disciplined of places. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we see people going down for spring break in Florida and all sorts of other things. Our, our Catholic schools have been open this entire year. We don't have any... Uh, indications that they are super spreaders. Somehow they, they've been able to be disciplined about the, the, you know, whatever threats exist from the, the virus and at the same time to conduct, conduct their business. At the very beginning of the pandemic, we heard about super spreader events where people were singing together in choir practices. But we haven't heard imp any empirical evidence that what's going on in the churches is any kind of public health threat. So um, mm -hmm. the, the places that we're seeing, and it's not only Canada, the United States, and and uh, the UK, it's everywhere. Uh, someone joked the other day that the days of Cromwell are back in Ireland, where the mass is actually forbidden. It hasn't been forbidden in Ireland since those awful days. So uh, something is going on, and I connect it, I don't think illegitimately, with a kind of a, uh, an overall sense that many, many things are essential to human life, but religious worship for a lot of people now is not, and a lot of people particularly mm. in positions of authority who can make decisions about what, where police show up and what kind of restrictions are imposed. Father Jerry, that's a great segue. This week, Cardinal Dolan, your, your um, the archbishop, and others are making the case that if you can go to Costco and the grocery, maybe it's time to return to Mass. How big a challenge is it to get people back in the pews after a year of habituating them to watching the Mass on Zoom, or maybe not watching at all? It is a challenge. I think the uh, spread of vaccinations and uh, approaching that herd immunity is going to make a big difference in, you know, allaying people's fears. Uh, but, you know, as we've seen and I've seen in my parish, uh, we've been able to observe necessary precautions. People have been able to come mm -hmm. to Mass. Now, it was necessary, I think, very wise to have these televised masses. You know, I can't tell you how many of my parishioners watch EWTN every day. Uh, it's a mm -hmm. wonderful gift from the airwaves. Uh, but now, once it's no longer a health hazard to go to Mass, then people should realize they're under an obligation. Uh, this is a canonical obligation, you know, originating from the Ten Commandments to worship God, keep holy the Sabbath. And you can be excused from that if you have a serious reason. But that serious reason, thank God, is being uh, lifted as more people get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. During his first Easter address, President Joe Biden and the First Lady were joined by a special guest to deliver a rather odd Easter greeting. I'd like your reaction to this. Watch. Easter's a day of joy when we celebrate resurrection and renewal. The virus is not gone, and the second year in a row, most will be apart from their families, their friends, and the full congregation that fill us with so much joy. May God bless you all. May God protect our troops and take care of the Easter Bunny. Father Jerry, uh, the president neglected to mention a certain someone in his greetings there. Your thoughts? Well, yeah, he left out the word the. We celebrate the resurrection on Easter. 
You know, this is unfortunately mm -hmm. part of political correctness nowadays, that if we actually refer to the real nature of a religious holiday, we're somehow offending people who don't believe in that. Uh, it's the other way around. We're offending people by taking advantage of religious holidays and just identifying them as kind of secular celebrations of renewal and resurrection. No, it's the resurrection, and Christians uh, celebrate that. It's a, it's a miracle. It's a gift from God. It's the most important moment in the history of the world. If other people don't believe that, uh, I'm sure they want to respect our right to observe our faith and that they can reserve, you know, we respect their right to practice their faith. So, you know, we're, we're getting into this uh, kind of strange world where we redefine things because we're afraid we're offending people all the time. In the meantime, we're actually offending both reality and the people who accept it. Yeah. Bob, the, the president used uh, this resurrection, not the resurrection, to kind of segue into a vaccine pitch. Um, what do you make of, and, and there were two Easter addresses, by the way, both of which led to go get your vaccines and make sure you're wearing masks. Uh, are, are you concerned about using religion in this way and using these holy days in this way? Well, of course I am, and I, I, I wish this was the, the worst thing that the president has been done, be, has been doing, because he's obviously even insulted the Catholic faith or the Christian faith in many more serious ways than just leading out of the. Look, he, I don't think he is going to ever become our pastor in chief as much as he's trying to portray himself as this, this profound Catholic. Um, he could easily have said, "We're in a, we're in a season where Christians celebrate." the resurrection and the rest and all of us can celebrate coming back from dark days mm -hmm. and and returning to normalcy and, and whatnot so yeah the, the, we we know that this was a kind of a political uh way to, to link the the actual christian holiday with the, the politics of coming back from the dead the the, the, the pandemic uh, mm -hmm. i don't know that it's going to work particularly well i think people who are going to get the the vaccine are going to get it and those who are opposed are not going to get it. But this is the president that we've got. Uh, and he's, as I say again, he's, this isn't the worst of what he's been doing in terms of our Catholicism. Well, he has a, he has a tough balancing act because there's a sizable part of his base that's rather secular, and they don't like this religious talk. It makes them squeamish, and they say, shut up, stop talking about it. I mean, you see it on Twitter every time he even mentions, you know, God or, uh, or, or uh, my goodness, or, you know, they, 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 they sort of jump at him. So it's a balancing act here. Uh, Vatican Secretary of State Cardinal Pietro Parolin made headlines this week in an interview he gave to a Spanish radio network. He talked about divisions within the church, which he believes spring from resistance to Pope Francis and an inability to distinguish this between what is essential and cannot change and what is not essential and must be reformed, must change according to the spirit of the gospel, end quote. Father Murray, what might he mean by non-essentials that must be reformed according to the spirit of the gospel? Well, this is a, a flawed analysis, in my opinion. Uh, whatever he decides is not essential would seem to be something that must be changed. You know, wait a minute. Uh, how many things in life are customary and supportive of other good things? You know, good manners, correct speech, proper diet. I mean, things that we strive for to try and make life better. In the church, you know, we say the rosary, we genuflect. I mean, uh, we do all kinds of things that are customary and good, and people might want to change them, but they shouldn't. Now, as regards to the most mm. essential question here is, uh, divisions in the church uh, reflect the fact that under Pope Francis, controversial and, and we can say documented departures from previous teaching and practice have occurred. You know, we can't forget Amoris Laetitiae, uh, Pope Francis granted people who are living in adulterous second marriages the right to receive communion. Uh, this has never been said and never been done. And to say that uh, those who follow what every pope up to Pope Francis said about the matter are divisive, no, that's politicizing a dogmatic issue. We think the pope made an error and a mistake in saying that in Amoris Laetitia. And guess what? That's part of what the Pope calls for in the church, dialogue and openness. The Pope wants to hear from people so he can better understand the point of view. Now, I'm afraid the Dubia Cardinals didn't get an answer and no one else has. 
Uh, so don't blame the people who object to Morris Letizia for divisions in the church. In fact, we're united in the truth, and the truth will set us free, not a false unity based on always saying yes, yes, yes to whatever Pope Francis says, because, you know, in matters, he's not infallible in matters in which he's not invoking infallibility. <clears throat> mm. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Bob, um, as, as Father Jerry was saying, uh, Cardinal Paroline here is saying the faithful are really just confused about the nature of Pope Francis's reforms, hence the division we're seeing. Do you buy that analysis? Well, when I first read that headline, I, I hoped that he was talking about Germany and, and the German-speaking countries. <laughs> That's what I thought, too. <laughs> where, where it's so obviously the case that people don't seem to understand that there are certain uh, well-defined truths, very well-defined dogmas in Catholicism that simply can't change. And, and we know what they all are. It's homosexuality and abortion, women priests, and all, all that sort of stuff. But then as I read into the article and I saw that there was this reference to, to uh, Pope Francis, who has been deliberately ambiguous about these things. I would, do diff I would differ with Father Murray. I almost never do, so I have to point this out. That he doesn't explicitly say in Amoris Laetitia that divorced and remarried people can receive communion. But that's the teaching that has come out of it. That it's assumed because of a couple of footnotes mm -hmm. and things that happened after the fact that that's what he said. Clearly, that the, the bishops who were assembled in, in those two uh, meetings to, to talk about these questions of family and marriage did not allow him to go down that path. And he was quite irritated and, and frustrated at the end of the process as, as a result of it. So it, it's not as if the people who are standing up for traditional teachings are confused. They know quite well what the teachings are, and they're confused about why a pope is not upholding those. Um, with the, you know, with the, the places like Germany, I think that we're, we're about to see something remarkable. We're about to see a new system in the church, unless there is some wow. intervention of the Holy Spirit and, and things begin to change. But um, I was actually, when I finally read into it, I was a little bit insulted because it gives the impression, and I, I don't believe Cardinal Paterlin is this type of man. It gives the impression that those of us who are, are trying to be faithful to our own Lord's teachings about marriage, sexuality, family, and many other things are somehow prejudiced or we're biased because the Pope is a Latin American or he's more merciful than, mm -hmm. than we want to be. I don't believe that that's the case at all. I think that we know quite well where he was going with this. There was resistance, and so it hasn't come out in its full expression the way it could have, and maybe that's what he's frustrated about, thinking that people don't really understand when, in fact, we do. Mm. Uh, Cardinal Parolin also addressed the controversial and still secret, I might add, Vatican-China agreement and the church in China. He said, what has been attempted and is being attempted is to protect this community, which is still small but has great strength and vitality. Everything is being done is to assure a normal life for the church in China, to guarantee space for religious freedom and communion, because one cannot live in the Catholic Church without communion with the successor of Peter, with the Pope, end quote. Father, how does the Cardinal think this agreement is moving the church in China toward communion? The government doesn't seem to be allowing it to move in that direction at all. No, you know, if the attempt is to protect the interests of the flock, well, then why was the flock surrendered into the hands of a bishops named by the Communist Party of China? Uh, no, mm -hmm. the, the deal, by the way, if the deal is so good, why haven't they published it? Uh, the, the deal is unknown, and in, as a matter of practice, the Chinese Communist Party is dictating to the Catholic Church what it can and cannot do. Uh, children are not allowed to be catechized. They can't attend church services. You know, the right. bishops have to be members of the Patriotic Association. Uh, they want them to sign a pledge that they're going to support the program of the Communist Party. Uh, you know, the, the normalcy in the church means fidelity to Christ in the church. It doesn't mean subservience to communism and communist dictators like what we have in China. So, you know, mm. Cardinal Zen in Hong Kong has spoken so eloquently about what's going on. And, you know, in a church in which we're supposed to respect the prophetic voice of the local community, uh, I think Cardinal Zen speaks much better than others about what Chinese Catholics really want. Yeah. And, Bob, uh, I mean, it, this goes down to the distortion of the gospel itself. Communist authorities are rewriting that mm -hmm. and inserting communist propaganda 
into the scriptures. This almost seems like sanctioned heresy on the part of the Vatican to, to allow their people to go in and absorb that and read the Ten Commandments of Xi, which are written on the wall instead of the Ten Commandments. You know, I hear from friends of mine who are well informed in Rome that Cardinal Parolin actually tries to moderate some of the wilder things that we've seen happening in Rome over the last eight years. And so I don't think that he, he is deliberately undermining the church in China. Although it, if he were trying to do that deliberately, I don't know how it could be any worse. You know, when he right. said this, uh, you, you feel so frustrated when you see a man so obviously laboring to make a case that is sim simply not true. We have no empirical evidence that there's been any improvement in the, the situation of Catholics in China. And why would we expect that? This is a, a communist regime, his father was saying. You know, I always, right. I, I think of, of there's a, f a famous episode right after the French Revolution when the uh, Catholic bishop and uh, diplomat Talleyrand, uh, a, 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 an atrocity, there were many atrocities after the French Revolution, but, but there's a, an atrocity and Talleyrand said, it is not only a crime, it is an error. Well, in this case, we've committed a crime against those Catholics, I think. I don't think deliberately on Pauline's part, but it was a, a gross error to think that engaging in, in any kind of negotiations with a communist regime, which has its own dogmas and its own church and structure, which is opposed almost in, in, in the way Marxism was founded, as opposed to the Christian understanding of human individuals, human persons, and human societies. It was foolish to think that that type of regime would be willing to make an accommodation that would be real toward those Catholics. Sure, you, they mm -hmm. can't be in an irregular situation forever, but this has handed them over to one of the most brutal types of ideology in the history of the world, which killed 100 million yeah. people in the 20th century, and it's still going on. Well, and it continues to brainwash them in concentration camps right now. These are brothers and sisters in the Catholic faith. These are uh, Muslim Uyghurs. Anyone who doesn't conform has to be reconditioned and reprogrammed. And the, the problem is, and Cardinal Zen has written and spoken so eloquently of this, when you bless that kind of heresy, you're blessing something obviously not in communion with what Rome portends to support. So I, it, none of this coheres. None of it makes sense. And worse, there's no good fruit on the ground that can be seen on any front. But we'll see what happens in the days ahead, but it looks pretty bleak from where I sit. Uh, I want to talk a bit about the outrage and dissent over the Vatican's recent decision to ban the blessing of same-sex unions. Father Jerry, your recent column singled out Belgium Bishop Johann Bonny, we've spoken of him before, and others like him, who are expressing embarrassment over the Church's teaching on this issue. Cardinal Christoph Schonborn, one of the architects of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, responded this week this way. He said, if the request for a blessing is not a show, so not just a kind of superficial right, if the request for the blessing is honest, if it is truly the request for God's blessing, for the life path of these two people, in whatever condition they find themselves in, are trying to make, then this blessing will not be denied them. Your reaction, Father Jerry? Well, it's terrible to see a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church in open defiance of Catholic dogma and, and recent instruction approved specifically by the Pope. Uh, what Cardinal Schoenborn has done is disgraceful because he is severing the necessary tie between faith and obedience. Uh, we obey the teaching of the Church, and when that teaching of the Church is enunciated clearly as it was by the doc Congregation of Doctrine of the Faith with the approval of Pope Francis, we have to follow it. And the doctrine is you cannot bless sin, you cannot bless sodomy, you cannot bless a relationship based on mortal sin. Now, on the Vatican side, uh, they face a very serious problem here. If Cardinal Schoenborn is not instructed to recant, and Bishop Bonney the same thing, then they are tacitly tolerating uh, a schismatic and defiant uh, usurpation of the Church by her very pastors. And this is very serious. And Bob referred to maybe a schism in Germany. Mm -hmm. What we're facing here is a day-by-day -day progression in which bold people who reject Catholic morality 
and yet remain as the head of diocese, are using their authority to try and convince people to commit sin. Uh, this is mm. unbelievable, but it's happened, and the Vatican needs to do something. I remember when Cardinal Sarah gave a very legitimate uh, endorsement of celebrating Mass at Orientum. He was called in to see the Pope uh, and instructing quite clearly that this is not what the Vatican is interested in. Well, I hope Cardinal mm -hmm. Schoenborn gets a similar call, and I'd say Cardinal Sarah's point's legitimate, whereas Cardinal Schoenborn's point is completely wrong. You cannot bless the union of homosexuals. It's a pseudo-marriage, and it's leading them to complacency and sin. Bob, uh, is this another link in that, uh, that schism chain that we're seeing assembled between what's happening in Germany and now this? And might, might the Catholic Church go the way of the Anglican Church, where you see you know, parts of it breaking off over these sexual issues? Well, this is nothing new. We, we know that there have been these, um, these homosexual celebrations inside the St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna. Um, I run a program in Europe. We didn't run it last year because of the virus, but I, I'm in Vienna once a year on my way to run this, this program in Central Europe. And I think it was about 2016 or 2017, I was meeting with some Austrian Catholics, and one of them mentioned to me that the week before, there had been a pro-life march, and Cardinal Schönborn did not march in it. But the week before that, there was a pride march, and he did march in it. So I don't know what's happened to him from the happier days when uh, he was working hand in glove with Ratzinger and John Paul II and developing the new catechism. He was, he was very, very helpful. It, he's, a, a, he's a Dominican. He studied Aquinas. But there is something that has happened to him personally. Um, and it's not just going along with the flow in Germany. I think that he has himself engaged that um, that infidelity, and I think we have to call it that, because, look, anybody who really believes in, in the Catholic faith knows that blessing something that is intrinsically wrong is not going to help people. That you can try to make this be a happy situation, but it's not going to be. It's not going to be because it doesn't, it doesn't proceed along the plan that God himself, which is to say the reality that we all live in has been, been ordered by God himself in a certain way and by following that order, it, it's what makes us happy. This is not ultimately going to make these people happy, either on earth or at lacking repentance, uh, making them happy in heaven. So it's, this is a profound disaster. And I'm sorry to say I think we're going to see this play out even worse in the next months mm -hmm. and years to come. Before we go, a legendary or notorious, depending on your perspective, theologian Hans Kung passed away this week at the age of 93. Kung was ordained to the priesthood in 1954. He served as a theological expert at Vatican II. He later became one of the most persistent dissenters from church teaching on everything from contraception to abortion to papal infallibility. In 1979, he was censured by the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, ruling that he could, quote, no longer be considered a Catholic theologian nor function as such in a teaching role. This week, the Pontifical Academy for Life issued a statement via Twitter upon the news of Kung's passing. It read, disappears a great figure in the theology of the last century, whose ideas and analysis must always make us reflect on the Catholic Church, the churches, the society, the culture. Father, aside from the tortured English, your thoughts on this tribute to Hans Kung, and what is his impact on the church? I mean, he was a militant dissenter on so many things from Humanae Vitae on. Yes, uh, he was forbidden to teach in, uh, an, as a Catholic university professor. Uh, that was the Holy See deprived him of that. No, he is not someone we should reflect upon as a great figure in uh, Catholic theology because he rejected so much of Catholic teaching. Uh, it's very regrettable because he was energetic, intelligent, hardworking, uh, but he was essentially following the tenets of modernism you know, the heresy condemned by Pope Pius X. He basically wanted to recreate Christianity and Catholicism, rather, into uh, Protestantism. So uh, I know Bob's written about 20th century theology. I'm sure he could put uh, Kung's perspective uh, more clearly. He was definitely not part of the great Catholic intellectual tradition. Yeah. You beat me to the punch. Bob, 
put Hans Kung into that tradition in terms of church history and theology? Very quickly. Well, look, he was very influential around the 60s, around Vatican II, as was Karl mm -hmm. Rahner, as was Edward Skilibex. And America Magazine has recently pointed that those three were quite influential in the second half of the 20th century. Whether either of them will have much staying power, I don't know. His father rightly says he's kind of a modernist. And, of course, the strength of a modernist is they try to engage the modern world. The weakness is when the modern world moves on to the postmodern or post-postmodern <laughs> world, they're not au courant anymore. They're not so much cutting right. edge. I don't think he is... Uh, he, look, he tried to put forward a kind of a global ethic. Maybe that's something that had some uh, influence somewhere. But I don't think he's a stayer. And I have to say that there was a certain lack of gentlemanliness about him. You remember that he, uh, uh, Pope Benedict XVI made a point of meeting with him when he became pope. Yes. They had a, a meeting of several hours it was kind of cordial. They'd been colleagues at university earlier. And afterwards, Hans Kung said, yeah, but, you know, Joseph Ratzinger is really just a medieval theologian. I think that's very ungenerous. Um, Ratzinger, I think, will be a much more influential figure over the long term than Hans Kung was. Kung was the first genius at using modern media to get attention for himself. And that mm. had its influences. But in the longer term perspective of the, of the faith, uh, I think others will have a greater influence than he will. Yeah, it's always better to hold on to the Eternals. Uh, those, uh, those, those tend to have more longevity, but we'll see what becomes of Hans Kung. We'll leave it there. Commentary by Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray can always be found at thecatholicthing.org. Thank you, Posse. We'll check in with you soon.